have church this afternoon, huh? I'm not sure. I don't know. That's what y'all acting like. I'm just trying, just, trying, just trying to make sure. Amen. Praise God. We're so thankful for all of you that came back out this afternoon. We thank all of you that are watching us via live stream. It is a blessing once more and again to be in God's house on the Lord's Day. Amen. 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 To have this opportunity, um, not to just have one opportunity to come together, but another chance that we can come um, on a Sunday afternoon because we serve a seven-day-of-the-week devil. So we need to be people that are in the world word at all times that we can get it so that we can find courage and strength to help us in the time of need. Um, we know we'll be in Exodus chapter 19 verses 1 through 7 as has already uh, been read. Uh, we've been going through this series of lessons on Sunday afternoon walking through the Old Testament scripture. Um, we know that on last week um, we were with Moses and the children of Israel um, after God had sent several plagues um, upon the land of Egypt and um, he just had to keep doing stuff to get Pharaoh's attention. Pharaoh was a stubborn man. And it seemed like every time he said, you know what, I'll make up my mind to do such a thing, he would change his mind again. And so God would have to send a plague after a plague after a plague after a plague. And finally, God sent the death of each firstborn son of each house. And apparently that got his attention because it was after that that he let them go. And we see the children of Israel that they have gotten out of bondage, but now they find themselves on their way to a land. They don't really know the direction, but they're trying to get out of there. And now now they found themselves after they were trying to get delivered. They found themselves with Moses uh, with the Pharaoh and his army behind them. They got mountains on either side of them. They got the Red Sea in front of them. Where can they go? Man, you talk about a rock in a hard place. They were they were in a rock in a hard place. They had nowhere to go. And God said, You know what? I'm God. And there is no God beside me. All I want y'all to do is just stay right there in the fix. Stay right there where you are and watch me be God as only I can be. And we saw how God, even in that rock and a hard place kind of situation, split the Red Sea and allowed the children to come across on dry ground. So when they got on the other side, they didn't even have mud between their toes. That's, That's just right. how God fixed that situation for them. So here we are, the children of Israel are now making their way to Mount Sinai. Now, where Moses saw the burning bush. Y'all remember that? The burning bush that was on fire, but it was not consumed. And as we just read in Exodus chapter 19, verses 1 through 7, we need to keep in mind here that the Jews had started a new year um, when they were delivered out of the hand of Egypt. And it is believed that this third month will be what we call the month of May, around that time. So they, when they get to Mount Sinai, they camp out, and God speaks to Moses, and he reminds him of what he did to the Egyptians and how he brought them out on eagle wings. In other words, Moses, this ain't no time to get discouraged. This isn't any time for your people to get discouraged. This is time for y'all to keep your eyes, to keep your mind Focus on what it is that I'm done for you. And if you need any reminder, just look back at what I just did for you in delivering you from Pharaoh. And this is a beautiful analogy because when you look at an eagle, an eagle, or any type of bird, you ever notice how much care they take care of their young? And, and how much care they take care of their children? And they are willing to follow them very closely as they learn how to fly. And you know, Jay, you may not have got it on the first round, but guess what? I'm going to bring you back up here to the nest. And guess what? Tomorrow we're going to give this thing another try. And if it, if it begins to fall, the mother is going to help it out. And God took great care in looking after the children of Israel. And he has that same care and that same concern for us as his children today. And, and then the God makes a conditional statement, though. He says that if you will obey my voice, then you will be a special treasure for me. Now, God is a loving God. He's a loving God, but he always demands one thing from his people. That's obedience. Yes. God demands obedience from his people. And the same is true for us today. We will be his special treasure if we learn how to obey his commands. Now, God goes on to say that he will make the children of Israel a kingdom of priests. This sounds familiar, don't it? And, and he's going to call them a holy nation. The children of Israel is a type of us that we are in today, the church. So 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5 says, you also are living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable unto God through Christ Jesus. 
He says like this in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. But you are a chosen generation. You are a what? A royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who has called you out of what? Darkness and into the marvelous light. We were who once were not a people, but are now the people of God who had not obtained mercy, but you have now obtained mercy because you come to know Jesus. So did you know the similarities in that? Did you notice it? Those who choose to obey God's word and become Christians, we are considered to be a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and a holy nation just like the children of Israel. But our kingdom includes both Jew and Gentile. Not just one, we got both in a million, and we are now considered the spiritual Israel. Galatians chapter 2, 3 and verse 29 says, And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So we read in, in, our, in the text that we gave, verses 7 through 9, the Bible says, So Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before them all these words which the Lord commanded him. Then all the people answered together and said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. Don't that sound like us? Lord, I do what you say. <laughs> Lord, I'm going to follow your word. I'm going to do what you commanded me to do. Sounds good, don't it? <laughs> so Moses brought back the words of the people to the Lord. And the Lord said to Moses, behold, I come to you in a thick cloud that the people may hear when I speak to you and believe you forever. Just in case anybody got any doubts in their mind. After I come down and do this, ain't going to be no doubt in nobody's mind. So Moses told the words of the people to the Lord. Then the Lord said to Moses, go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow and let them wash their clothes and let them be ready for the third day. For on the third day, the Lord will come down upon the Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. Could y'all imagine that? Being there? The children agreed. They all were in agreement that they were going to obey God's command. We're going to do what the Lord said do. And Moses tells them how God is going to the sin on the mountain in a thick cloud. And they are going to get the opportunity to hear the very voice of God. If there were any skeptics in the crowd, they were going to be gone after that happened. They would get firsthand experience of God. Now, you would notice they were to clean their clothes. They had to clean their clothes. And they had to clean themselves in order to get ready for the third day in which God was going to speak to them. Now, this cleansing that they went through symbolically represented their purity to God. As, a, as time would go on, we read about how the Jews would always purify their physical bodies before they would touch or, or go into the worship of God. And this physical purification or sanctification is a type of the spiritual sanctification that we go through in this day and time. First Peter chapter 1 verse 22 and 23. He says, since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth in the spirit in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart, having been born again, not of a corruptible seed, but of a incorruptible seed through the word of God, which lives and abides in you forever. Paul says it like this in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 through 11. He said, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. Here it is, and such will some of you. Tell somebody, but thank God for but. Just that word, but. B-U-T. Thank God for but. He said, and such was some of you, but you were washed. But you were sanctified. But you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Now we learn from Paul's conversion that one becomes spiritually clean or purified by the blood of Jesus Christ at the point of baptism. Acts chapter 22 and verse 16. And now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. What? Calling on the name of the Lord. Now only those who are purified 
will be able to stand before God as a holy nation. Verses 12 through 15, we read about how Moses instructs the children of Israel not to go near the mountain. And if someone does, they ought to be killed. He also instructs the men not to go near their wives during this time. Man, what are you talking about? You can't even go near your wives at this time. Let's read Exodus um, chapter 19. Let's look at verses 16 through 18. He says, then it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there was thundering and lightning and a thick cloud on the mountain, and a sound of a trumpet was very loud, so that all the people who were in the camp began to tremble. And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was completely in smoke, because the Lord descended upon it in fire. His smoke ascended like the smoke of the furnace, and the whole mountain quaked greatly. Could y'all imagine how scared you would be at this moment? I don't know if it's just me, but how, how much fear you would have on the inside of you at this moment. Storms are scary enough by themselves. But to see this thick cloud and lightning and, and, and the fall on this mountain and this mountain began to quake. Then add to it, you got this loud uh, trumpet being blasted louder and louder. And another thing of interest, if you've been keeping up, of how many times Moses goes up and down the mountain. Up and down the mountain. You know, if we're not be careful, we'll read and we'll just think that it's only twice that he went up. But there were several times that Moses went up and down this mountain. And this brings us to chapter 20, where the people hear the voice of God and he gives them the what? The Ten Commandments. And the Ten Commandments can also be found in Deuteronomy chapter number 5. But we read the first four commanded commandments, or what we'll say are duties to God. Those are the first four commandments. And the last six commandments are duties to man. So the first four are duties to God. And the next six are duties to man. Now the Ten Commandments are the foundation on which all other ordinances that Moses will later give will come from. And can I tell y'all that even though it's in the Old Testament, you still need to obey them living in the New Testament? That even though it's written back then that we shouldn't just throw it out the window, but it's still stuff that we need to live by in this during time. Let's give them a look. Now, Exodus chapter 20, verse number 1. And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods. Now, this command is simple. Don't, don't even think about putting another God or anything else before me because I am God. Yeah, we live in a world where people put everything and anything before God. He said, you shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers of the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments. Now, the children of Israel had been in all, they had all kinds of idols down there in Egypt. I mean, if you wanted a God, they had them for you, and a plethora of them. They had all kinds of idols, and they would see the Egyptians bowing down or worshiping the man-made images. God makes clear that he does not want idols as part of our lives. God also makes it clear that he is a jealous God. And he doesn't want to share his worship with anybody else or anything else. And we got to be careful that we don't find ourselves bowing down to idols. And, and, and don't, mean, don't mean a statue or anything like that. I believe that if you put something before God, that is a form of idolatry. When you put anything before God. Verse number seven, he says, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Oh, it's a lot of folk walking around. Y'all know it. They think God last name start with a D. 
But you just think about it. Think about it in the conversations that we use God's name and what comes after that. It's taking the Lord's name in vain. And he will hold that against us. Now, when God's name was used, and when we use God's name, it should be used in a reverent way. That's why the scripture lets us know that holy and reverent is his name. His name was not supposed to be used in a crude or inappropriate way. To do so is disrespectful to God. He says this, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. Somebody need to tell these jobs that want to work you seven days a week. <laughs> Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work. You, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor the stranger that's in your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that's in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath, and he hallowed it. You remember that there was a man that was just on the Sabbath day, they were just going about picking up sticks. And God said, put the man to death. All he was doing, he might have been trying to keep his yard clean. God said, I had already said, don't do any work on the Sabbath. And that just lets us know God means exactly what he says. And he says exactly what he means. If it's in his word, we don't need to think second about it. Just do what God said do. Now, this is the only command that is not restrained for us under the new covenant. Now, the children of Israel were to take the seventh day as a day of rest, which was to honor God in that he rested from work on the seventh day in creation. Now, something that is really interesting with this section of scripture is that you can clearly show that creation took literally six days. Notice in verse 9, he says, they shall work for six days, obviously, six literal days. Verse 8 says that the Sabbath is one literal day. Then God uses the same language describing how he made the world in six literal days and rested on the seventh day. This is easy to see and cannot be misunderstood. Now, verse number 12, he says, honor your father. Oh, this is a good one right here. He says, honor your father and your mother. Who here it is. That your days may be long in the land which the Lord your God is giving you. Oh, man, I, if, if I think of a lot more people actually read that and understood what it meant, we have better relationships between parents and children. And, and so many young people would not be so easy to rear up at their parents and to get attitudes with them and to, and to tell them what they want them to hear when they realize, hey, man, you ain't doing that but shortening your days. You ain't doing that but cutting short your own days when you don't honor your mother and your father. Now, just as God wants all his children to honor and to respect him, he wants you to do the same for your earthly parents. Same thing in the New Testament as well. Verse 13, you shall not murder. We, we know that thou shalt not murder. You cannot kill someone just because you feel like it. You can't feel some, kill somebody just because they made you angry. You had to get them back. That's not an excuse for you going out and murdering somebody. He says, thou shalt not kill. Verse 14, uh-oh. You shall not commit adultery. Now, God's plan from the beginning was that a man and a woman was to marry, and they were to share a special relationship with one another. And this relationship was never to go beyond that man and that woman. God made this law to protect the sanctity of marriage and the home. And the same concept applies to us that is living today. I know we got folk that think, you know what, I can go out and, you know, when I get tired of her, I get tired of him. I go ca cast them in and get me another one and keep on going like it is. But, but that, that's God does not look at it that way. 
God looks at marriage, the unity of as a holy institution. It is ordained by God, and God does not take that as a joke, and we should not take it as a joke. Verse 15, you shall not steal. Simply, don't take what don't belong to you. Verse 16, you shall not bear false witness against your labor. Stop lying on folk. Look, don't just stop lying on folk. Stop lying, period. When they say period, poo, just stop lying. That's it. <laughs> you should not bear false witness against your neighbor. In other words, don't lie against your neighbor just to get them in trouble. Always be a person of truth and be willing to speak the truth at all times. There are a lot of people out there in the world today that ain't got no problem telling a lie. And I tell you a lie to cover up that lie. And when you come back to ask them about that lie, they got a fresh lie waiting for you. People, some people, my granddaddy was a liar. My daddy was a liar. I'm going to be a liar. Verse 17, he says, uh oh, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. Stop wanting what other folk got. Stop asking God why such and such got this and why you ain't got it. Don't covet what belongs to nobody else. Because you're not careful when you start coveting what other folk got, it'll lead you into having a jealous spirit. Which will lead you into living a life of sin. You should not covet your neighbor's house. Uh oh, don't covet your neighbor's wife. Nor his male servant. Nor his female servant. Nor his ox. Don't even want the donkey that's out there in the field. Nor anything that belongs to your neighbor. I tell folk all the time, we wonder why the grass is green on the other side. And you know, so many times people say, oh, if I can just get over there, they want to be over there. And when they get over there, they recognize that that grass start looking like the grass that they had. Because when you get over there, you're going to do the same thing to that yard that you was doing to the other yard. And now your yard that was looking pitiful now is looking all green and plush and got fruit growing over here and growing over there. Take care of yours and it'll look better than what you see. Verse and so it seems to be in human nature that sometimes to lust after those things which you do not have but your neighbor has. If all you do is focus on things you wish you had, you'll be miserable. Yeah. And it'll most likely cause you to break one of the other commandments that he's already given. And we're taught the same thing in the New Testament, that we are not to be a people who covet after things. Instead, you ought to learn in whatever state you find yourself therein to be content. Now, the children of Israel didn't want to hear God talk anymore directly because it scared them to death. They were fearful after they had heard that. And they would rather Moses just tell them what the Lord had said. But now they knew for sure there was God. And they had better take care and be serious about what it is that God was telling them. Now, in chapters 21 and chapter 22, God makes several more laws on how to take care of problems that may come up. You can read these in detail on your own, but for the sake of time, I want to summarize this. In chapter 21, um, verses 1 through 11, several laws concerning servants, um, one which states that only one has to be a slave for six years and that they were to let go in the seventh year. Verses 12 through 27, the laws found here have to do with violence and what should be done to murderers and, and kidnappers and servant abusers. Verse 28 through 36 deals with laws about animals and their death. And then chapter 22, verse 1 through 15, deals with mainly the property, the property theft or either damage. God got answers for everything. And folk ain't just start acting a fool today. They've been acting a fool since the beginning. Folk ain't just start breaking commandments today. They've been breaking commandments since God gave them. God said, don't eat off that tree. I got to eat off that tree. We've been breaking commandments since the beginning. But God has always, for his people, provided a means for them to be redeemed. 
He's always for his people provided a way for them to be brought back to the place where they need to be. To into a right standing with God. And even with these people, I could just imagine these people now for walking around. Moses got us out here. It's hot out here. It was hot in Egypt. <laughs> Moses got us, Moses got us out here. And man, we start. I ain't ate all day. Man, I want that. Man, I want red lobster. I want longhorn. I want that. I want that. I want this. I want that. It's hot. We got to get it. And, and all the while, they're complaining, but God was providing. Oh! while they had excuses on why we don't want to be here and why we don't want to be there not realizing that hey man it's a mere miracle that you were even able to get from where you were to where you are right now and God deliver those people and God said you know what I if y'all if y'all yeah if y'all from Missouri and I got to show y'all something let me come down and show you God comes down in the smoking and they ask to get to hear the voice of God and you know, when folk, I, I can imagine, you know, we would have been the same way after God comes up. Yes, Lord, I'm going to do what you say. <laughs> oh, Lord, that's what you Lord, I'm not going to, I, I did it yesterday. I ain't going to do it no more because that's what the Lord said do. And yet we all know what the Lord said do. And we have time to do what the Lord said do. <laughs> He's given us commands. He's given us uh, rules, regulations you can say that we ought to follow after. Not because God is just trying to make life so hard for you. And not because he wants you to have as much tension as you can as a child of God. But God wants us as his children to learn how to be obedient. Amen. What does the scripture say that obedience is better than sacrifice? How many of us can look back at certain choices that we made and say, man, I wish I would have just obeyed instead of sacrificing. I wish I would have just did what I knew what was right rather than taking a chance and trying this and trying that and getting myself in situations that I did not have to end up in if I would have just been obedient unto the word of God. Let me tell you, if God said it, obey it. That sounds easy, don't it? But when the tire hit the road, it ain't always as easy. And that's where it comes in as a child of God. You got to be like Moses. Find yourself in the face of God. Talking with God. Having conversation with God. Seeking God for answers. Seeking God for the solutions that you need in this life. You can't get the solution by yourself. Just like I tell people, even though Moses was the leader, Moses didn't know how to get out of Egypt. Moses didn't, he didn't know they were supposed to go north, south, east, west. He didn't know where to go. He was just following where God told him to go. And that's the same way it is in our Christian world. We don't know where we're going on a day-to-day basis. Sometimes we just like we like we walking around with a flashlight in the daytime. We just lost. We don't know where we're going. That's why we got to trust God. And we got to seek him. We got to pray that prayer. Lord, order my steps in your word. Lord, direct my steps. Lead me in the path that you would have me to go. Now, don't ask him to end that and deal with time come you don't want to move your feet well lord you order my lord that, that look like where i'm supposed to go but this over here look more comfortable that now nah, that i know that's where god want me to go but i just feel like i want to stay right here i'm comfortable i'm I, i'm right here wherever god calls us to be that's what we ought to be that's what we ought to be doing what it is that God has commanded of us to do. And even though God gave those folk command, I know some of them couldn't wait because God got through talking for them to break some command. They couldn't wait. Oh, he said we can't. Oh, let me, I ain't never tried that before, but he since he said we can't do it, let me go out here and give it a try. Children of God, we have that same attitude sometimes. Even though we know what's right and we know what's wrong. Been in the church longer than Brother Peterson been alive. We, we, know, we, we know what's right. <laughs> and we know what's wrong. Yet we find ourselves making decisions that are not right. Saying things that we ought not say. Being involved in things that we ought not be involved in. And what is that? Sin. It's all sin before God. Even though we brush it off of our shoulder as if it's just a, a daily thing that we're going through, it's sin. And we have to deal with sin or sin is going to deal with us. We have to allow God to come into our lives and to aid us in those areas where we are weak. 
Because on earth by ourselves, we are not able to handle the situations of life. But with God, he gives us the strength to be able to stand against that stuff. And we just be obedient unto it. What we say in the song, trust and obey. Trust and obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus. Now, you're going to be miserable if you're walking right here trying to do stuff on your own and not being obedient. But he said the only way to be happy in Jesus is to just trust and obey. Trust when I don't know how this goes. Trust and obey. Be obedient. And in the end, God will give you the answer that you're looking for. I can, I can just assure there was doubt going through these folk minds. Even though they had just started on the journey. Man, when are we going to get there? It's hot. When are we going to get there? We've been walking long enough. We passed that rock yesterday. When, when are we going to get to where we need to be? Trust and obey. Just be obedient. Do what I told you to do. And in the end, you're going to get to where I want you to be. And that's why I want to encourage the believers that even on this afternoon that each and every single one of us are, are going through our own wilderness experience on a day-to-day -day basis. We are all going through things. Let me tell you, as you strive in your day-to-day -day walk to live for Jesus, as you strive in your day-to-day -day walk to be an example for Christ, there are going to be times when you find yourselves going against the very commands that God has gave. But we as children of God ought to rejoice in the fact that God has provided a way that when those times come, that we can repent and we can be brought back into a right relationship with him. And that's good to know. That we are not, do not have to um, suffer the consequences of those sins. But we have an opportunity to go to God and ask him to forgive us. And he'll restore us and give us an op another opportunity. Amen. My brothers and my sisters, maybe there's someone uh, here on this afternoon. And you, even yourself at this time, um, don't have a right relationship with God. Maybe you're watching us and you're not yet a member of the body of Christ, which is the church of Christ. We extend unto you the Savior's invitation. Come to him by hearing his word, believe in the same, repenting of your sins, confessing Christ as your Savior, being buried with him in baptism, and the Lord himself will add you and make you a part of his body. If you are watching us, maybe you're here this afternoon and you're standing in the need of prayer. The Bible says that the prayers of the righteous, they avail this much and I'm sure all of us have something that we need prayer for um, so if you're standing in the need of prayer if you're subject to the invitation you have that opportunity now to come as together we stand and sing the song of invitation sweet I know, sweet I know.